So, I know I've already said hello to most of you, but hello and welcome, guys, to um, our first annual Global Game Jam at Azusa Pacific University. I'm the program director and professor of our games and interactive media program here at Azusa Pacific, which is actually a new program that's launching in the fall. And so, this isn't only our first annual uh, Global Game Jam, but it's also the official launch of our program. We've got a Bachelor of Arts degree uh, program starting, as well as a minor in games and interactive media. And um, I'm really looking forward to the new year and seeing new students come in and do that. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight and, um, and start our 48-hour marathon of making games. Um, by the way, the, the uh, major in games and interactive media is a four-year comprehensive 50-unit program um, that covers everything uh, from game history to game theory to UX and sound for games to game art uh, and actually has you uh, do a number of um, large-scale team uh, projects by the time you finish uh, the program. Um, so uh, hopefully those who are uh, watching the stream as well as you guys here might consider coming here to APU at some point to uh, get a degree in, in games. So um, I know that there's a, a lot of you here from different backgrounds. Um, some of you are from the school, some of you are from outside of the school. Um, just so you know, this is a Christian school. And um, because of that, I'm actually going to open this up in a, in a uh, really quick prayer uh, for our weekend. And um, just, uh, yeah, we'll do that. So uh, dear God, I just ask that um, this weekend be uh, fun and um, Easy going for everyone here, that no one gets hurt or sick, and that um, the times we have together are fun and, uh, and fruitful, and we make good friends and uh, lasting memories as we go through this weekend. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, um, speaking of which, uh, I figured this would be a fitting uh, way to sort of launch a, a games program by doing a game jam. I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? Um, we're going we're gonna to immerse ourselves in, in at least uh, trying to uh, get a bunch of games made uh, by the end of this weekend. Um, so we're not the only ones doing this, though. The Global Game Jam is literally global. There's actually over uh, 900 ga uh, global game jam sites spread across over 100 countries around the world right now, with literally 10,000 people making games this weekend, which is kind of crazy. Um, and so uh, we're not the only ones streaming. There's tons of other people streaming. And in fact, we're going to be streamed into the Global Game Jam's uh, official stream at 10 a.m. on Sunday. So I'm hoping that at that point, we can maybe present what we're doing, talk about some of the, the trials that we've gone through, the experiences that we, we've had, and things like that. Um, and by the way, we are being streamed right now, so why doesn't everyone just say hi? Hi! hi. hi. To our two viewers. Are here. <laughs> <laughs> we were at three. Three. Oh, three. Oh. Nice. Okay. Uh, hopefully it'll be Mike, much more than that. Awesome. Awesome. Mike, you All right. You could break the internet. <laughs> so in a few minutes, um, we're actually going to be watching the official Global Game Jam keynote video, which has a few people talk to you about sort of their approach to making games and maybe ways to get inspiration about making games. This is also the time after the video that they're going to unveil the secret theme for our weekend. And if you don't know this, the Global Game Jam is built around a theme that they provide to us that we have to use to make a game. So for instance, let's say that the theme was rock. What does that mean to you? It could mean music. It could mean a heavy thing. It could mean rocking a boat. There's a lot of inspiration that can be gotten from that. So we're going to be looking at that, that soon. Now, though, um, I, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce some very special guests who have made a, a crazy trip out here through storms and, and, and adventures, and, and hopefully they've gotten some treasure along the way, um, <laughs> to open our time together. Um, this is uh, John Berquist and uh, Chris Skaggs from Soma Games, an organ-based games company. First, Chris over here, which, um, you know, I guess they'll see you as you uh, come on stage, <laughs> uh, is a 20-year veteran of the software industry with 10 uh, of those years specifically in mobile PC and console gaming. As the founder and lead designer at Code Monkeys, Chris has delivered creative and clever software applications to some of the country's most discerning clients like Intel, Four Seasons, Comcast, MGM, and Aruba Networks. As the lead game designer at Soma Games, he's directed over a dozen mobile games PC games, and most recently, the epic adventure The Lost Legends of Redwall, The Scout. Additionally, as a black belt developer with Intel's Worldwide Software uh, Developer Network, Chris also writes and speaks on topics surrounding the rapidly changing entertainment and mobile application environment as venues like, uh, at venues like GDC Next, 
CGDC, Casual Connect, Tech Start, Serious Play, and App Up Elements. Chris is a graduate of George Fox University in Whoa. Newburgh, Oregon. And with Chris is his colleague, John Burquist. John is the chief, uh, chief marketing officer for Soma Games. He joined Soma as a communications consultant in 2008, helped build the company in, and helped build the company into what it is today. He joined the company as the communications director full-time in early 2011. While John handles the marketing and communications side of the business, company culture and helping creatives launch and grow in their craft is what he really enjoys the most. John is also currently a speaker and leader at Boot Camp uh, Northwest Men's Ministry, something he has had the great opportunity to do for 14 years now. He is frequently asked to speak on topics like hearing God's voice, parenthood, marriage, and connection, and living out your calling in every aspect of life. John lives in Salem, Oregon with his wife, Christine, of 22 years, and their two teens, Natalie and August. So please welcome with me Chris Skaggs and John Burquist from Soma Games. Thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, before I start too much, I know if, uh, Pig Squad up in Portland is watching or playing along. Way to go. Let me ask a quick question because this is a relatively small group. Uh, Fortnite or Overwatch? Who are we dealing with here? Let's go Fortnite. PUBG. No? What? PUBG. PUBG? <laughs> For, uh, Overwatch, anybody? I like it. Well, at least that's what people, okay. Okay, you, like, that's a pretty, like, tepid response. What do you all play in here? Is it Call of Duty? What's what's the big, what's like keeping you busy? the original Fortnite better. The original Fortnite? Yeah, the all old save, save the world format. Save the world format. So yeah, the one where you the zombies defense. and all that. You just like you just like shooting your friends. I just like playing tower defense games. <laughs> oh, that's fair enough. Okay, me myself, I'm actually a mercy main, and so uh, I'm one of the only people who's willing to play support in my whole um, state. <laughs> so, uh, so that song should have played mercy. That was actually about me. Um, so um, let me tell you a little bit about how we got into games. As uh, as Tim mentioned, um, uh, at, what is just specific? It's a Christian university. We are also Christians. But it's not, we never wanted to make Christian games in the sense of like David Goliath games, that kind of stuff. It's not that I am against those, that's just not what we're doing. Um, so let me tell you my story. It's going to include some theological moments that uh, just deal with it. Um, so I don't know where you come from, but uh, this is my story and how, how Soma Games started. Is in 2005, we had a software business and we were making websites and websites became databases and that kind of stuff. But I, I actually went to uh, went to uh, an event which kind of opened my eyes to some ideas regarding what are the kinds of things God might want to do in the world. Um, and it was kind of really shocking to me. I didn't grow up in the church, and so all the I didn't have any of the lingo. I didn't have any of the culturation. So it was all, all of this was pretty fresh at that time in my life. And shortly after being exposed to the notion that God might actually have a plan in the like in the moment, and not just sort of a great big giant plan, but like maybe something for me. Was when uh, was when Grand Theft Auto uh, San Andreas, I think, was in the news for the infamous hot coffee mod. And so, if you don't know the story, there was this uh, uh, arrangement of, of keys and, and, and buttons that, if you did this, it unlocked a pornographic scene in the game, and everybody flipped out. Right. So this was the kind of stuff that got in front of Congress, and Hillary Clinton was involved. And a bunch of blue hairs were mad, and uh, Walmart pulled it from the shelves. It was a big, huge, horny mess. And uh, right in the middle of that, so you're watching the news going, wow, that's, that's probably unfortunate for some people. Um, I think Sony said they lost over a billion dollars just in that one moment, so it was kind of a big deal. Um, but then in the middle of all of this news coverage, there's this little sidebar that says, by the way, if you thought maybe you don't need to play games about beating up hookers and stealing cars, uh, there's actually a Christian game developers conference, like it's a thing. Now, I'd never heard of that. I didn't know that Christian gaming was a thing. I certainly didn't know there was a conference for, the, for that. And it turns out it was just that weekend and up the street for me. Now, as I mentioned in John's bio, there's this notion that is uh, that is about whether or not people ever hear God's voice. What whatever that means to you. And I don't necessarily mean, you know, you know, sort of the audible voice, but if and when God actually communicates to us on an individual level, that was a moment for me that that I was convinced that he did. And largely it was just that little nudge. It was just a little bell ring that says, Oh, I need to look into that. And so, so I did. I kind of clicked on the button. Turned out that there, like I said, that's where I found out it was just up the street in that weekend. And I, again, you're just sort of following the the signals. You're like, maybe I should look into that. And so I, I register and and, uh, and pay my ten bucks. And uh, and at that point, probably five fifteen minutes later or so, get an email from the guy who runs the thing. His name is Tim. And Tim said, hey, it just so happens that there's a TV station in Boston, and they want to do an uh, like a show 
on on this idea on, on Christian gaming. Like, is anyone going to be in Boston in three days? Um, and I'm I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be me. Which, it, to be clear, is a stupid thing. But there was just a clarity in my head. Like, that's supposed to be me. And so I wrote to Tim. I was like, you've never met me. I just signed up. But I I think I'm supposed to go to Boston. He says, I don't need to know you. If God wants you there, figure it out. And so uh, so all of a sudden I'm like, okay. Um, now, now in this moment, you got to understand, like, all of this is very new to me. Like, every part of this story was radically new to me. Like, I, hearing God's voice was new. Like, certainly Christian gaming was new. And all of a sudden, I'm supposed to be on TV on an industry that I just discovered five minutes ago. <laughs> None of it made any sense. But you're trying to, like, be good with the whole, what you've been given. And so in that moment, I made a deal. By the way, be careful of making a deal with God, because he'll take you up on it sometimes. But the deal was this. Like, God, if this is you you got to pay every thin dime of this trip. I'm not going to put one penny into this thing. Make it work. Like, prove yourself, right? Um, just not advised, but whatever. That's what I did. So, uh, so, so I show up the, the next day at the, at the conference, and at this point, I think CGDC was quite literally a group about this size, meeting in a church basement, all hobbyists. No one, like, it was sort of just roughly like, hey, we kind of like games. And it's, it's about right. Um, and so I show up, but there's a guy at the other end of the room, and I sit in the back just trying to stay out of the way. And this guy clearly has experience with something that was so boring. Like, I can't even describe the amount of boring it was. But it was all about distribution channels and, and markup things. and all. Like, this is before, really, things were being sold digitally. And so he was talking about all these really arcane mechanisms that are, are very important, I'm sure. It's just I couldn't like blood out of my ears. I mean, it was just like so, so incredibly dull. But in his defense, the moment he was done, he folds up his folder and he walks straight back to me like he knew who I was. And he's like, hey, God told me I should talk to you. What's up? Which blew my mind. <laughs> I'm like, bah, 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 bah. And, uh, and sure enough, it, like I kind of told him the story up to this point because I don't know what else to do. Like, I'm not going to lie to the guy. Um, and so he goes, oh, in that case, I know, I know what this is for. And he whips out a stack of papers that he has prepared for someone because God told him to be prepared for this. And it's basically like all of the things anyone would ever want to know about game distribution. Because someone needs to know that. Um, and, and, and so he's like, you know, I hope you have a great trip to Boston. And at this point I'm like, that's crazy. And as crazy as that was, in the next two days, that happened eight more times. And I never said a word. I never introduced myself. I mean, I, I guess probably at some point someone's like, there's a guy in the back who has no idea what's happening. Um, but all of these folks, and I, I met, all, I met uh, my teacher. So I, my, the very first introduction to gaming was, was a, like a decade earlier. I took like one class down in San Diego. That teacher happened to be at this conference. She's like, I didn't know you were a Christian. She's like, I didn't know you made games. And all of a sudden we kind of reconnected. But same thing is he's like, oh, well, while you're here, let me show you this is how you deal with a hostile interviewer, right? So like, in all the stuff I learned, and all about distribution, I learned all about the craft, I mean, so to speak, what you can do in a couple days. Um, I was given probably like a metric ton of marketing material for the games that were in the market. I learned how to deal with interviewers, I learned what to say, what not to say. All this stuff's like a giant crash course, and I was just like drinking from the fire hose, man. Um, so it was just crazy, day after day, it was all this stuff, and I'm, I'm just stunned at the, at the way that this is happening. Now in the meantime, my friends and my family, they're kind of hearing about this. They're like, this is really cool. Like, well, I can't, you know, I'll, I'll take care of your rental car. And I'll take care of your hotel room. People are like pitching in like it's like passing the hat or something. And, uh, and so by the time it comes to Sunday afternoon, everything's paid for. And I haven't done anything. So like the hotel, the car, the flight, no, no, the flight. No, not the flight yet. That's the part that's missing. I'm totally, I guess, as prepared as I'm ever going to be. Except, of course, the big deal is how do you get to Boston with no time notice? So... The last speaker at CGDC is a, is a guy named Bill Bean. At that time, he was uh, the CEO of a company called Digital Praise. Bill finishes his keynote. He's closing up the whole conference, and, and it, he does the same thing. Now he walks right back to me and says, "Well, oh, here, there's some stuff going on. What, you know, what? Tell me the story. So I'm kind of used to it at this point. I tell him the whole story, and I'm just like, but alas, Horatio, uh, you know, I have no plane ticket. How do I get to Boston? And he's like, I can help you. <laughs> now, this is before 9-11. And so he, he busts out his, his folder and he has a ticket on Southwest that you can use anytime, anywhere. It's just like this open prepaid ticket thing. And I'm like, God to be sh you got to be kidding me, is what I said, I think. Um, and, uh, and so so I'm like, that's crazy. So I jump, it's just a lot like this. I jump on the computer, type up Southwest, and, and you're like, wah, wah, wah. As cool as that was, there's no flights. Like, oh my God, we are so close, God. 
It's very like I learned a lot. God, really, that's serious. Like, way to go. That was cool. But I'm glad I'm not going. Um, except then he's like, Chris, you need to go to Borders. And I just, you need to understand, in this moment, it was super clear to me. That's exactly what he said. It was clear as day, and I knew exactly what Borders he meant. But do they still have Borders down here? Borders Bookstore. It's yeah. a bookstore. Yeah. Um, and so I knew exactly what he meant. And I'm like, okay. Now all along, my friend Matt. Um, who at that point was working with me, he was along for the ride because I think I needed a witness. I think quite literally I needed someone to say like, this actually happened. Because as soon as that popped up, I'm like, Matt, we have to go to Borders. He's like, okay. So we race off to Borders, which is just a couple minutes down the road. And I walk into the foyer, and as soon as I'm walking in one door, a guy I know from church walks in the other, and we look at each other, and he looks at me and he's like, you're here for God, what's going on? And like, oh, like his antenna goes up and I'm like, I don't know, man. And I tell him the whole story. Well, Mike turns out that he, he's an author who has miles, like thousands of miles on every airline you can imagine. And he just gives me his little folder of all of his frequent flyer numbers. And he says, somebody's got a flight to Boston. Figure it out, take whatever it takes. So I do, and Northwest has a flight. I get in the flight and I'm on, and all of a sudden I'm on my way to Boston to be, to be on TV. And, and all this time that's also going on is Remember, like a couple days ago, we had nothing. And so in the process of, of this whole conversation, God has downloaded into my head, this is how I'm processing it, everything that we need to know. We've got a, we have a logo, we have a name, we have a domain name that, that literally two days prior was not available. And, and that's the whole thing about what are the games you need to develop. Like he's downloaded this whole business plan in, into my head. I'm just trying to keep up with writing it down. Um, of course, all this training has gone on, all this other stuff has happened. And, uh, and suddenly I'm on the airplane to go to Boston. Now, now uh, the show is called Night Beat. It rides out of Boston. It goes about six million people up and down the, the, the New England. And it was usually hosted by a grumpy old man who hated Christians and, and was just sort of like a, you know, I'm going to be a journalist and take care of people and show the truth. He was just this grumpy old coot. But at the last minute, he gets sick and has to leave. And so they replace him with this gal whose name is Portland. I don't think anybody's name is Portland except the gal who's interviewing the guy from Portland. It was the weirdest like <laughs> switch, but her name's Portland, and she's kind of a new age sweetie person. And so like like she's not a Christian, but she's certainly more open to spiritual things, and she's just not a grumpy old man. Um, so so there was this last minute switch, and then what they had done is they really wanted to pick a fight. So the truth was this show had another guest on the TV whose book was called Everything That's Bad Is Good For You. And so what they really, I think, hoped to do was like, let's get the, the like hacksaw Christian in here against the guy who thinks evil is good and watch him fight. It'll be great TV. Um, but that's not what happened at all. In fact, this guy's book is really interesting. It's not what you would think from the title. And he and I agreed on most everything. So we had way more in common. And there's, there's such great shots in the, in the TV. You see me saying whatever I'm saying. I'm talking. What you can see is Portland on the other side of the camera looking at me like, you are ruining my show. That's not, we were supposed to be fighting you, and now you're being nice, right? So now, of course, she was very sweet, like, oh, that's so nice, but that was not how she was feeling. And so this whole experience goes by, and all of a sudden, like, out of nowhere, God has put this thing together that I didn't spend one thin dime on. He paid for everything, made it all work, and all on, like, three days' notice. And I'm on the flight going home being like, that was crazy! What just happened? Oh my gosh, I get to be a video game developer. Because wouldn't it be great for God to say, go with thou and make video games for me and my name, Tris? That would be stellar. Except what he really said on my way back home was, you have a lot of homework. And for about the next three years, it was. It was paperwork and business plans, and I don't even know what I'm getting into. But the ideas that started that one day on Soma have never left. And the, the concept, I think, behind the company of Soma revolves around a lot of things that John and I talk about at boot camp is things about the original glory of mankind far surpasses and is far deeper than original sin. That, that joy and life and the dignity of humanity is far above our fallenness and our brokenness. And that there is so much more to be had, as Jesus says, at the renewal of all things than a picture of, of this reality, which is just, what did Kubrick say? Just know your lines and don't bump into the furniture. Like if there's a picture of Christianity that frankly is, is as boring as hell, and if you'll forgive my use of the term, why would anyone want to do that? Why would anyone be interested in that? Why would anyone be fired up about that? If it's just this, this picture, like there's so much more out there. And I think that Soma Games was partly founded on that principle, like if we're gonna be, if we're gonna call the creator of creation our king, then it ought to be we ought to be, be, be creative. 
We ought to be able to have access at least to, to joy in life and, and something that is far bigger than, than the folks who don't know him. That would be the principle. But too often, Christian gaming at that point had become a place where good ideas go to die. And, and really small budgets make really inferior products. And there was a whole circuit at that point of Christian gaming that had literally become the second worst performing sector in all of gaming. The only thing worse than Christian games were movie games. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so you're like, well, we got that going for us, right? But, but often it was, it, there was partly some really good reasons, that there was no access to capital. Nobody was investing in this stuff. And the only people who were even marginally investing in it were investing in edutainment. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have this whole thesis that says that gaming partly is, is, is antithetical to, ev to evangelistic notions. For one thing, it's like art at its best is raising really powerful, good questions. Like when you think about The Last of Us or when you think about um, other, other games that really touch you, so maybe that's... Um, I don't know, maybe that's Halo, maybe that's, maybe that's The Last of Us or, or Uncharted or something else. These, these games that raise questions, that's where art really wins. Evangelism by its nature is to answer questions, and they're not in the same world. And so, in fact, I think they often pull against each other. Now, frankly, education and gaming have the same problem. They have the same fundamental draw apart from their core values, which is why that whole category of edutainment so often feels clunky and it feels difficult, and we would try to squeeze education into a game, want something that's got to give. Either we lose the fun, or we lose the information, but they just don't live in the same space. It's an oil and water thing. It's not saying one's better than the other, I just think that they're incompatible at a root level. From that point, Soma Games finally got into actual writing code years later. When, uh, when the iPhone really started to take off and mobile was involved, we're like, suddenly we can make a game for a lot less than a half a million dollars. Like there's a real world space here. And at that point, indie gaming was, was in the toilet. Nobody was doing indie gaming really. Um, but the iPhone made that suddenly available again. Unity was a platform that everyone could get, get into again. And so suddenly for like a couple grand, you could make a game. And so pretty early on, 2008, 2009, we made a gravity game, kind of a gravity puzzle game. And while it wasn't a particularly big commercial success, it was a uh, an artistic success. And we got some attention and people said, hey, I saw that game that you made, maybe you can make our game. And that's when we got involved with Intel and MGM and all these other people as work for hire. And in that space, remember, we started with nothing. We had no contacts, we had no skills, we had no team, we had nothing. We were a bunch of web developers. So everything was ground up like, and nobody to show us what to do. Uh, we're also up in Oregon, so there's not a game development community up there at that time. You know, a few people. There were some folks in Eugene at Garage Games and Torque Engine and that sort of stuff. But it was pretty small. And, uh, and so we really felt like we were out on our own. Uh, but as, as years got by, we kind of just moved our way up the food chain. And little by little by little, um, we, we got uh, more, kind of more skill, we got bigger and bigger projects, and, uh, and we just kept going. Now, that leads us to about 2011, which was when we first got introduced to Redwall. Uh, Redwall, if you don't know, is a series of children's books, uh, well, teen books, kind of Harry Potter age range-ish. That, uh, that cover, there's 22 books that cover basically a medieval story set in an abbey in the surrounding area. There's mice and badgers with swords and they have adventures. It's really great, like kind of like high adventure, just fun stuff. Um, I had never heard of Redwall, but at that time it sold about 35 million copies uh, uh, around the world. Now for comparison, when Harry Potter was optioned for film, it had sold about 7 million copies. But of course when the film comes up, now you're no longer kind of a, a niche subculture group, you are now like the mainstream. And all of a sudden, Harry Potter goes through the stratosphere. Now at that point, nothing had ever uh, developed the, the, the Redwall property. So it was, it, was, it was totally untouched, and frankly, I'd never heard of it. But it came into our awareness through, through uh, you know, other, other spaces, and we were originally just hired to make a mobile game that might support another project, etc. But it was all like, I don't know, if you say so, like it just seems like, okay, like we can build whatever you want. We, we were at that point really happy building games for other people. Um, but one thing led to another with, with Redwall, and in 2011, just as we got involved, the author passed away, which threw everything into a, into a big tizzy. And there was a lot of legal dust that had to settle at that point. It had nothing to do with us. I mean, it was just the, the timing of the whole thing. But that transition between about 2012 and 2015, it gave us a lot of time for pre-production and really talk to the audience, like, what do you guys even want out of a Redwall game, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and so we weren't in any rush, and that was actually really, really good, because you're nodding your head. I get, are you a Redwall fan? Yeah. 
what we found is we would poll Red Bull players. We'd say, what do you want out of a Red Bull game? And they would say, insert my favorite game, but in Red Bull. They, there, was, there was exactly zero differentiation on, on genre, on size, on style. It was like, we, we had about exactly with the same number of points. We gave them 15 options. They were all within two points of each other, what kind of game you would want. So what we discovered is what they just really wanted was to live in that world. They wanted more exploration into that space to, to, to hang out with the mice and the characters and the food and the, and the adventures and the big giant badgers. Like, it's just a fun world to live in. And they didn't care. So it could be Harvest Moon at Red Bull. It could be GTA in Red Bull. I didn't care. It was just Red Bull. And that was a big awareness for us about what was really happening, I think, in so many games was actually the story. It was the world. It was the, it was the em embracing of something of a different place than, than the one they were in. If you all have ever had a chance to read uh, Jane McGonigal's book, Reality is Broken, really, really great book regarding gaming. Um, one of her core theses is that in a world in which we all feel increasingly disempowered, whether it's through, uh, through, through our politics, through our schooling, through our work, whatever it is, the more we feel disempowered, the more gaming appeals, because you get to do something that matters. You can slay a dragon, save a princess, you know, conquer the galaxy, whatever it is, you do something that feels like it has meaning and purpose to it. And ultimately it's about that, that and she would, she would say, in that world escapism isn't a bad thing. When the world you're escaping from sucks, then maybe it's actually the really healthy scenario. So, so for any of you who have parents or grandparents who were like, get off the stupid game, like partly they lived in a world that you don't live in. Mm -hmm. Partly they grew up in a time that had a different ethos, that had a different future, that had a different expectation than the one you grew up in. And if you're like me, a huge part of what gaming did for my life was it gave me something to focus on that felt like it could go somewhere. Or I felt like my contribution, my actions, they did something. When I would play D&D, it was about, it was about understanding a world and getting into it in a way that I couldn't do in my, in, you know, because I couldn't talk to girls in middle school. Like, whatever it was, it was always that way of, like, living a different life. Not entirely to get rid of this life, but to practice. To practice a different life. For, for me in particular, there's the ways in which gaming, and I had the same experience with regard to drama and being, and, and I got involved in acting when I was in high school, is it allowed me to put on a different face. It allowed me to, to, to try something and experiment with something that, that I couldn't probably do in the real world because it felt too risky. One of the like, social studies um, that, that really bothers the anti-gamers is that very often gaming kids actually have much better EQ than their non-gaming peers. Didn't expect that coming. The same thing has happened with folks who, it's not just about like, oh, it gives you hand-eye coordination. That's not really the big part of the game. It's about the ability to think laterally. That, that is the nature of gaming to try different scenarios, to, to mess with the variables, right? I'm, I'm going to see how this system works and I will break it. And, and that gives, gives the, a lot of players the ability to think in a way that breaks norms and it makes us much more competent in the ability to find new solutions to old problems. So to kind of bring all that forward, where we are with, uh, with Soma Games is uh, fairly recently, and we'll show you uh, a trailer here in a minute, uh, we just released um, our first episode of the Redwall Adventure Game. It's called The Scout. That released in September on Steam, and we are currently porting it to Xbox and PlayStation. And if we can, squeeze it onto a Switch. We'll see if that's possible. Um, and we also launched a second game in the Redwall universe called Escape Gloomer, which, great story that I could probably tell a whole other hour on, but uh, the guy who in the late 70s, early 80s, literally invented text adventure gaming, his name's Scott Adams, we, we met him. And uh, became friends, and he decided to come out of retirement to make kind of a, a new, updated uh, text adventure game. And we're trying to figure out, like, how do you make that whole uh, genre kind of fresh and alive? So we'll show you a, a, a trailer also from Escape the Gloomer. But I'll tell you where that thing is going is text is cool. Like, I like to write and read, but it's actually really cool on voice. So the ability to talk to this thing and have it talk back is actually really, really, I think that's where the magic is. So uh, you want to show the trailers now? I'll show you what's going on with the red wall. And what I'd love, because it's a small group, if there's any Q&A, that would be awesome. Um, but only, I don't want to take up your time. So um, I'll show you the trailers and we'll go from there. My friends and fellow scouts, tonight we celebrate a new member of our brotherhood. Mr. Hood! Three cheers for Sophia Rymaid. Huzzah! 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 Hello, Sophia. This is the hedging cough. Is that honeysuckle? 
Your father wanted to be a scout. Did you know that? Where did the rats come from? What do those savages want? Sea rats by the look of them. Vicious scoundrels. Just my luck. I would have started combat training tomorrow. Ugh. Everything in this place reeks of filthy mice. Also be swift. I can't let you do this. It's too dangerous. Just do as your dear Sophia tells you for once. Oi, you big disgusting gobslobber. Come and get me. <laughs> through the young otter at the thought of exile that would await him should he fail. Gilly grabbed the torch's handle, gave a quick, powerful tug. Far beneath Kotir Castle, the gloomer was a killer, savage and mindless, particularly when there was fresh meat to be had. Gilly's eyes widened in horror as he witnessed the oncoming gloomer. Gillig swam to the jumble of rocks, then he climbed out of the water. The gloomer was nowhere in sight. Gillig was in a large, glowing cave, his mouth gaping in wonderment. His eyes were drawn back to the emerald-studded amulet. He pulled it from the chest and placed the heavy chain over his neck. An enraged gloom was making right for Gilly. The Lost Legends of Redwall. Escape the Gloomer. Coming to Steam. Enter Dark Tunnel. With confidence on his shoulders, Gillig walked into the Dark Tunnel. And Amazon Echo with Alexa. Okay, so those are the things we've been uh, working on most recently. And uh, just as a quick note, um, the, uh, the Scout in particular, uh, we, it's, uh, it's an episodic thing, so we're working on episode two right now. Um, just to be clear, we are still an indie shop, and so there's about a dozen of us up in up in Oregon, and we're just trying to make the most of what we've got. One of the things we like about gaming, and I love to see the board games and the cards and the dice, is gaming is such a big target. I mean, electronic video games is one thing, but it's nowhere near the only thing. Um, the ability to spread the concept of gaming through physical products, through voice products, or everything else, there's a, there's a, a notion of freedom in gaming and in a delivery that gives all kinds of opportunity that doesn't appear in a lot of other places. So we're really excited and very thankful that we got invited down here. So thank you very much for having us. And if I've got, I don't actually know the clock, what you've got, but if there's time, I'd love to do some questions and answers if there's anything you can do, or, or rather anything you'd like to ask, just let me know. Um, and by the way, John, do you want to come up here just to, John is primarily, well, he does a lot of things. Uh, but, but I'll tell you, the, the thing that I want to tell you about that I wanted primarily to, to hoot is the gaming work culture can often really suck. Um, specifically, um, way too many hours, way too much crunch. Um, the, the reality is like that's kind of one of the dark secrets of the gaming culture is like when things go, go bad in that regard, they can be really destructive to families and to lives. And, and so it's not uncommon to see folks who get in, they work, you know, 100 hour weeks, and they fry their, themselves and they are out in three years because they just can't stand it. And who can blame them? One of the things that we've tried really hard in SOMA is to stay sustainable, to stay uh, healthy. And so, like, it's not to say that we never have deadlines or whatever else, but we try really hard not to crunch, not to be overtime. Like, we try to just plan our, our lives in a different way. Part of that is where we live, is that Oregon, frankly, has a probably about a half of the, state of the the cost of living as it does down here or in, or in San Francisco. And so the truth is we can just afford to live longer there um, and breathe better air. 
and <laughs> have trees and not have traffic. <laughs> Actually, that's pretty good. So the point being is that uh, John, uh, John here is is, a, is kind of the guy who's the minister of culture at, at Soma Games. So that is, how do we take care of people? How do we how do we handle each each person? The crew is has a story, has strengths, has you know has a family. And so we really make it a point to take care of those folks and be really, uh, uh, I guess, healthy about that. So so if uh, I brought him partly to take care of me because I'm crazy and easy to get distracted, and uh, <laughs> but also because I think that's probably a more important thing than the products. So with that, yes sir? I have a question. So there's two sides of the crunch argument, right? There's the side that it's detrimental and unhealthy, and there's the side that it's inspiring and gets a lot of problems solved. Um, have you guys come up with a way to facilitate the sort of deadline-driven um, inspiration that comes with that sort of vibe uh, and yeah. the lack of crunch time. Because we're at a Bible school, um, you know the story of Mary and Martha. And so, uh, so the story of Mary and Martha is that uh, they're sisters, Jesus and his buddies are over for lunch, and Mary is in crunch. And so Mary is all about like getting the dishes ready, being all, being all prepared and preparing the dinner, and Mary is uh, sitting doing nothing. And of course, the conversation is like, Mary's flipping out. She's like, or rather Mara, Martha is like, Jesus, tell my sister to come help me because she's sitting at your feet. And Jesus <laughs> chastises Martha, like, shut up, she picked the right choice. Now, lots of Marthas in the world will say things like, well, if there weren't for Marthas, nothing would ever get done. It's the, it's the productive crunch argument. But the thing is, that's the kind of thing Marthas say, to justify their own bad behavior. And so to say, like, well, the upside to crunch is that we get a lot done, is not this, I, I would argue, like, it's not worth what it costs you. And so even if the productivity argument has some validity to it, at what cost? And the cost is really clear, is people who burn out, they have, you know, adrenal failure, and, uh, and they, they literally, like, work for almost nothing and burn out of the industry in three years. So not to be, like, uh, didactic, but that's real. I think it's, I think there is no upside to that argument that isn't so easily answered by just the facts. It kills people. And we do a lot of things to counter that. Like for example, Christmas time, we shut the whole shop down for two weeks, paid vacation. Um, we send everybody home, and that's kind of nuts. Like Christmas is one of the biggest reasons you get ahead in the game industry is you sell games at Christmas. But we 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 do these things to kind of counteract that. Um, every Wednesday uh, at 9 a.m., we have what we call Jesus time. Kind of sounds like or like a like Sunday school. It's not. It's like anybody in the shop can bring a spiritual topic, and we watch a video, we listen to a podcast, and then we discuss it, um, you know, as a team. And it's it's a real great way for us to say, you know, God comes first. And, but it also is like we're all growing, we're all learning together. Um, another piece is like we really try not to work on the weekends. We try to shut things down. If, and, and we don't mind what, if anybody's up working late at night because they get a great idea, awesome. But don't like disrupt everybody because you're crunching it, which is, crunch is important. Like there are seasons and times for crunch. And don't get us wrong, like that has to happen. But if that's a way of life, like Chris said, you will burn out. Your family's going to burn out, or ignore you. Like say, like he's not around, she's not around, and not taking care of us. And we're looking at this. Our friend Morgan talks about like in, in business and life and and um, and fun. Is this sustainable? Like seriously, look at those things you're doing in your life, business, game design, whatever. That is that sustainable over a long period of time? Because we're we're in this for the long game. We really want to be there for you know ages and ages because of the, of the work that we feel like God's got us into. We don't want to be a flash in the pan. Yeah. Anybody? Yes, sir? I'm, I'm really curious. I, I, can you talk a little bit about the process? Uh, with Redball, you're right, and it seems like you could make any and every kind of game in that world and, and do it about an audience. Uh, yeah. And I'm curious, how did you cull that down into what you ended up producing? Well, probably the, the short answer to that is that we had a lot of a lot of time to talk about it, mm -hmm. and so uh, we have a very collaborative team, and and so we could discuss options like, well, what if we did this? What if we did that? And uh, and because there was no time pressure, it allowed us to kind of let the the cream of the crop rise rise mm -hmm. to the top. Now now in the end, you're still kind of guessing in regard to 
how ambitious is this going to be, how much time do we have to spend on it, etc. Um, what we thought is, bottom line, why we eventually went with an adventure game was for people who didn't know Red Wallet, who weren't already fans, it was probably the most logical place for them to engage with sort of the spirit of the books. Um, and, and, uh, and it was also something that for us probably was something that was a stretch, but without feeling beyond us. Um, and, uh, and so the opportunity seemed like that was the right fit. From a, from a broader perspective, we also decided what we wanted to do was rather than make, say, one big, you know, giant adventure game, we'd rather make several small adventure games. One, there, there's a monetary reason to do that, and kind of like, don't put your eggs all in one basket. Um, but it also allowed for kind of a tentpole property, which would be the scout and the episodes, with, with the whole constellation of smaller products, from mobile games to, you know, Escape the Gloomers, just the first of several. And so we, we, we got two mobile games designed for this year. Um, they try to introduce people at different levels. Um, and so, you know, maybe you're just into the casual games. Great. But now we get to introduce you to the books. You get to see the world. And, uh, and so kind of have this whole smaller, uh, smaller footprint on individual experiences um, that, that, that no one's expected to put 80 hours into the game. That's, that's not what we're... And that, not that I would love to make an 80-hour game, but sure, we, did ever, we would not be able to do that. And so let's not find out more we get you. Yes, sir? Um, so, how do you guys view um, player feedback? We take it super serious. Go Very ahead. serious. Uh, so, Chris and I do, and our and our CFO, we do a lot of the, uh, of course, like the business side, marketing side, strategy side. And so, uh, right before Christmas, um, we were spending a ton of money on ads on Google and, and social, and we we're getting a lot of traffic, but very few conversions. And so, the, the, uh, a part of that is like, okay, what what is this about? Why? We wanted the player feedback. We wanted the, the customers that were coming and trying to figure out what that is. So we, we created a survey. We have thousands of people coming to the websites today. And so we created a survey that was really honest. Like, like A, are you a Redwall fan? One to 10. Are you, uh, do you want to buy the game? One to 10. Why not? You know, what would make the game better? And that has been golden. Like, we've had uh, hundreds of, of responses to that. So now we've been able to look at this, and some of it's validating what we've thought uh, the fans wanted by talking to a, a, a smaller group, but now we're having thousands of fans of Redwall and people that maybe have never heard of Redwall that are looking into adventure games. We're able to like, like, uh, change the target a little bit, and change that target a little bit like addresses what the fans are wanting. And so we listen to, we get comments, hundreds and hundreds of comments on social, um, and we we really tight talk to each each of those people. Yeah. Like today, we had one that wrote in and said, um, your mice are bothering me because there's no lip sync. Oh. Yep. And we're already addressing that. So we, I jumped on in the car, Chris and I are driving down there, and I said, actually, we're going to work on that. We're working on that right now, and thank you for writing it. And that just, that fan is a super fan now, because you talked to them, and you took their feedback, and you didn't, you know, just kind of brush them off. Yeah. So it's super important. I think with regard to... Redwall, but any fandom would be used to. It's like, folks want to know that you care about the property like yeah. they do. And so we were in early access for about a whole year. Um, and, and it was for exactly that question. Like, are we are we delivering the world? Do you feel like this is, you know, that it's fitting in? And I think with Redwall, we, we found that there's about three quarters of the people see Redwall as a positive place. About a quarter of the people experience the game as something pretty dark and violent. They like that, uh, but that's kind of their experiences. They're like, that was so gory, and I go, whatever. And so, so you had this question, like, your experience, I'm probably not going to be able to make both of you happy, but we can make three quarters of the people happy, at least given the experience that they have, that they was hoping for. And for, for players, you know, we, we, probably, we probably invested too much time into the platforming aspect of it, um, and, and not enough time in, in the story delivery aspect of it, because where we are right now is now that it, it's live, the main feedback we're getting is that the people who came here for the story we're kind of in their way in some in some opportunities. Like like it's a little bit too difficult for people who really just want to have interaction with the characters. And so that is a great place to like. If it weren't for player feedback, we wouldn't know that. Um, but they say, you know, I just want to talk to these people. And uh, and you're making it difficult because your checkpoints are too far apart. You know, and when I fall off the cliff, now I got to go back 20 minutes. And they're like, well, that's an easy fix. I'll just put more checkpoints in the game. Done, right? And we'll make sure that we bring all the directions that they're super clear done you want to you know you need a marker on the map so you don't get lost on the map done like it's actually really easy but we would never get that if it wasn't for player feedback
Yes, sir. So we're going into a big weekend where scope is key um, to get something done. And uh, being a smaller shop like you guys are and, and sort of assessing the, the complexity um, with your schedule and you know everything else, do you have any words of wisdom for uh, the owners? Uh, do you guys teach Agile? Uh, I mean, our program starting in the fall, but yes, we do. Okay. Yeah. So long story short, if you, the Agile methodology says that, that today is the day that you know the least about your project. And, and, and uh, with that understanding, you start really, really, really small. And, and you iterate first, and, and so in the game thing, what we would iterate is like, pick one thing, just one thing, and get that loop working. Now you might start with, say, a half a dozen ideas, and really quickly whittle it down to one. See something that's fun, get that core game loop rock and solid, then add to it. What a lot of people do is the opposite, is you're like, I have 17 ideas, I'm gonna make a game that uses all of them, and then you try to whittle it down, but that's much harder. Start with one thing and build on it, and I think you'll find it goes a lot faster, and iterate often all the time. Never get connected to an idea or a mechanic. Like, you've got to have player feedback. You've got to have people say, like, that's a stupid idea. And, uh, and then you got to be willing to, like, sacrifice that, that sacred cow. Well, you've um, also got this idea. So Chris is our main designer and writer. So the idea of thrashing early, like, and yeah. thrash hard. Like, come up with your ideas, beat it to death. Like, like every scenario that is against it and for it and all those kind of things and, and don't like hold anything back but come up with an idea and then lock it down because you know one thing is is like Chris will be like going about programmers and the artists are going down the stream of what he said to go do and he's like he goes on a mountaintop and comes down oh, big idea and he comes down he's like four months later hey I think we should move all of this over here and everybody's in an uproar because that takes lots of time and lots of money and if you have three days, right, like a like very short period of time, that's going to cost you. And so you find out that big idea, you thrash it as a team, you come up with a solid plan. And that doesn't mean you don't take little changes, but you can't make those giant changes. Fair answer? Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Well, Chris and John, thank you very much. Thank you.